major support for Out to Lunch Acadiana is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base, joneswalker.com. Support also comes from Wyndham Garden Lafayette. From Café Vermilionville in Lafayette, we're out to lunch with Professor of Finance and Director of the award-winning Birkin Road Reports, Peter Raschuti. It's business, Acadiana style. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Moro, sitting in today for Peter Raschuti. Welcome to Out to Lunch. If you travel around Louisiana, you see enormous differences from north to south, and even more from east to west. It's always been this way, to some extent, but the differences have arguably never been as extreme as they are now. Here in Lafayette and in Acadiana in general, we're going through some pretty major changes as we adjust to the new reality of the oil business. Meanwhile, just an hour's drive away around Lake Charles, there is enormous boom. So enormous that it's by some measures the biggest growth region in the country. Can you believe that? On today's show, we're going to take a look at what exactly is going on at either end of that one-hour drive between Lafayette and Lake Charles. Chad Thielen has his finger on the pulse in Lake Charles, and Debbie Springer is on the front line here in Lafayette. Debbie has been in the energy business for 37 years and is founder and president of Lafayette-based Ottoman Energy. Debbie started out in the oil business as a very rare breed, a female landman. After conquering the good old boy network, Debbie was president of another energy company before founding Ottoman Energy in 2012, and she's off and running and still running. Debbie, welcome to Out to Lunch. Well, thank you so much, Andre. Good to have you here. It's great to be here. It would take me too long to list everything Chad Thielen can get accomplished in a day not to mention his lifetime, but here's the short list. Chad is president of Lake Charles-based land management company, Lacassane Company, and there's an interesting story about that we may get to. He is president of the Borgenfield and Bell Savon Developments, which he's developing with the folks who developed River Ranch, as you know, here in Lafayette. And if that's not enough, Chad also manages a handful of oil and gas exploration companies. And there's more, but as I said, that's the short list. Chad. We welcome you out to lunch. Thank you, glad to be here. Chad, although Lake Charles is only a short drive from where we're sitting, right here at Cafe Vermilionville in Lafayette, it's light years away economically. While Lafayette and most of Acadiana is struggling to adjust to a reduced economy, Lake Charles is booming. And as we understand it from here, it's all a result of what we're now calling the LNG corridor an explosion, for want of a better word, of the liquefied natural gas business. For now, this is a massive building boom. It involves billions of dollars worth of investment. When the building phase is over and these LNG plants are up and running, will the boom be over or could it just be the beginning? Is Lake Charles going to turn into the 21st century's Dallas? What do you say about that, Chad? Well, I don't know if we're going to turn into that, but uh, it's certainly interesting watching what's happening here. Uh, there's uh, the industrial expansion is is tremendous. Uh, Lake Charles is relatively small compared to Lafayette, and we're looking at thirty and forty thousand construction jobs and twenty to twenty five thousand more uh, permanent jobs with all the ancillaries that come with these mega projects. Most of them are LNG based, but there's others, the Sassol project and Axial, Lake Charles Methanol, the, the port is expanding. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very interesting time to be in Lake Charles. Another thing, they've also expanded what used to be Chenault Air Force Base. It's now Chenault International Airport, and they've got the international designation, which means they can do international flights, whether they do or not. But uh, that's something that costs airports a lot of money to even do that, to be equipped for that. Um, and this is not the airport where people fly in and out of. This, this is a cargo carrying airport. It's become huge. Yes, it has. And uh, actually, it's uh, adjacent to our Morganfield development. 
they are attempting now to take over the Mallard golf course that's city owned on the property to put in an air handling cargo facility. Um, so uh, that could be a, another more diversified base for the expansion in Lake Charles. You mentioned with all those jobs, I, I'm wondering if there's a building boom of apartments and houses too. Well, there is. Uh, our uh, joint ventures that we've done with uh, Southern Lifestyle Development uh, include some of the Bell property, that's the Bell Savon Development in Sulphur, Morgan Field and Oak Grove and Highland Hills. I think we currently have scheduled roughly 3,500 residential wow. uh, homes and 500 apartments at Morgan Field, another 250 at Bell Savon. Uh, with uh, associated commercial space as well. Debbie, we told ourselves over the last couple of years that we're more diversified as an economy than we were last time uh, in the 80s. They came around and the oil prices took a nosedive. But last time the prices, they bounced back pretty quickly compared to what's happening now. This time it feels like we might be looking at a long-term realignment of the industry and of course that goes along too. There may be other types of energy that we didn't talk about 40 years ago. Um, so are we away from exploration and more toward what we've heard as oil mining, digging for shale? From your perspective, dealing with this every day in Acadiana, um, what's happening here and where do you think we're going? Okay, so I think really to understand the oil and gas industry in Acadiana, you have to separate it into two different categories. One category is the service companies. So that's pretty much the companies that you see when you drive down Highway 90 on the corridor to go into New Iberia. These companies provide drilling mud, pipe, casing, rigs, surveying, seismic, and it's, it's interesting, but no matter where in the world there's oil and gas exploration, the service companies in Louisiana seem to do it best. So if you go out to Midland, Texas right now, you're going to see more Louisiana license plates than you are Texas license plates. Okay. And when the Bakken was booming, they were up in North Dakota. And when the Marcellus is booming, they're in New York and Pennsylvania. And so what you've got is a service sector here, but they travel and they go all over the United States and even internationally to service oil and gas exploration. The second component of the oil and gas industry in Lafayette is exploration and production. We don't like to think about it, but we're really in a world economy now. So what we're kind of, we created our own problems by over drilling the shale when they discovered right. the technology to be able to do that. And that's when you go down, you drill straight down and then you take a 90 degree angle and you go out horizontally and then you frack that hydraulic fracturing, but everybody calls it fracking. Fracking, right. And right. it allows you to get hydrocarbons out. But So there's shale plays all over the United States, and we started exploring them very quickly, and we flooded the market with oil and gas. So we created our own problem. And now this late, and then OPEC kept flooding the market because they were trying to hang on to their share. And so now you've just got an oversupply. And um, China totally and India didn't totally come Totally different on. market than it was totally before. Totally different market. You know, now we're looking at an international thing. So we look to OPEC who, you know, may re if they reduce their supplies, then the price goes up a little bit. But then when that happens, a lot of people rush back in and start drilling these shale plays again. And then the price goes back down. So we're in a world economy now. Our oil field ex-workers in the oil field, are they now... Have they gone uh, an hour over to Lake Charles to work, Chad? Well, I understand some of them have, yes. Uh, those ones with the appropriate skills. Right, yeah. Um, and it, it's always in a downturn in the oil industry. Uh, if the price jumps back up, it's always difficult for the operators and the service companies to ramp back up because the workers are gone. Right. And you've got to train new people and they may not come back. You know, the old ones might not come back. So it's a... It's a conundrum there. I'm happy to meet Debbie. The Lachlan Company field has been very prolific. We started producing that field in the 1940s. And um, we actually own the minerals under the Lachlan Refuge, where we have some very sensitive operations with an operator 
from here in Lafayette that uh, they bring people from all over the world to look at the environmental practices done there uh, to ensure that there are you know no environmental issues with our operations there. That's well, great. Yeah. yeah, and I find just generally. Um, Oil companies are much more environmentally responsible than they used to be. And I mean, we're aware of it. Right. Let's just face it, when you look at an oil and gas company, it's really easy to say, oh, you know, oil and gas company are just these big, huge co companies or corporations. But, you know, they're made up of people just like us who grew up here, may have gotten educated here or elsewhere, are in the business. They're people. And the younger generation is, you know, we're really keen to to be stewards of the environment. Just to give you an example, when, when I first started working for Mandalay, and I realized that we were operating field that was in close proximity to the Intercoastal Canal. Um, one of the first things I did was hire a spill contractor, and they did spill drills with our little company, and even though we were small, we got to the point where anybody in the company right down to my secretary could handle a spill if, if we had some kind of oil leakage that would get on the water. Wow. Because we were trying to be good stewards of the environment. We were operating in a wildlife refuge. We were close to the intercoastal canal. We didn't want to shut commerce down. And we had it to, you know, we had the XY coordinates of the closest landing and where the field was located and everything so that that if a tugboat, you know, saw oil sheen at three o'clock in the morning, we could have that addressed in no time flat and make sure that it was completely contained. So those are the kind of things that, um, you know, oil and gas operators today do. And they, right. you know, the ones in Louisiana that operate here do it well. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Andre Morrow sitting in for Peter Rusciutti. My guests are the president of Lafayette-based Audubon Energy, Debbie Springer, and the man who wears many hats in Lake Charles, including property developer, land manager, and oil and gas explorer, Chad Thielen. Chad, where's the development happening in Lake Charles in terms of building well, and the, from the what, I guess? Roadway infrastructure issues, the, the primary issue in Lake Charles right now is the Interstate 10 bridge um, that is functionally obsolete and I think we're on the fourth environmental impact study uh, to replace that bridge. Oh, the Jean, that's the one with the cross pistols for the, yes, um, the Jean, the Jean, the Jean Lafitte, Lafitte bridge. bridge? Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know it's 70,000 cars a day over that bridge and it was built in the 50s. Uh, they can't seem to get their act together to build the bridge. <laughs> Those kind of infrastructure issues in Lake Charles are uh, are really, really a problem. Um, our developments are, are uh, south of the interstate, one in Sulphur, and uh, the Morganfield development is also south of 210 even, or next to Chenault actually. Right. Uh, so those, uh, and actually in the Morganfield development, um, back when I started acquiring the property in 98, um, there was a desire to bring a corridor road, McNeese Street, through the property that they had never been able to do with the previous landowners, which was Amico. So that's one area of Lake Charles that the infrastructure was completed prior to development. And it's been a collaboration between the city. We've annexed about 300 and, uh, 350 acres, maybe into the city of the 2,000 acre development. Um, and Debbie, it was in part of the old Amico sugar field and I have reserved some drill <laughs> locations <laughs> in it, <laughs> in case you're interested. Is it a barge rig or a land rig? No, there's land, no, it's land and it's, and it's prior converted and non-wet, so. Nice. <laughs> now, there's, the Lacassane Company is, Vast the the businesses that fall under its heading. There's so much going on from uh, mitigation to oil and gas to farming and the native seed project. Is right. there uh, a point where you come into conflict? Some of these come into conflict with each other and problems with each other. Well, that's a great question. Well, absolutely, they do. Um, Lacking Company uh, owns and operates wetland mitigation banks. And uh, when I'm wearing my other hat as a developer, and you wear uh, many, as we said, then I have to, 
call myself, who I hate to call <laughs> about mitigation. You know the, the oh, consequences yeah. of that. So, um, but uh, we started the first coastal prairie mitigation bank in the country, the pr- first prairie bank. And uh, that's been a real interesting project. The Bell family on our timber side had been restoring and, and protecting longleaf pine savannas long before the Clean Water Act came and anybody was even thinking about that. We were already doing that. And uh, As a matter of fact, I did my first marsh restoration project back in the 1980s. Uh, with no assistance from any governmental agency or anybody. We just bought a track hoe and fixed it all. And And now are you being called upon with the groups such as America's Wetland Foundation, which is one of the leaders? Have you been called into some of the uh, the private meetings they've had? Oh, yeah. The small ones at Avery Island and then the big public meetings, of course? Yeah, I've been you know peripherally involved in all of that for... Uh, years and um, we actually have uh, a couple of uh, we have a couple of large one particularly large project on the Calcasieu ship channel right now that's tied in to uh, the LNG plants uh, where we're restoring a, about a 300 acre marsh uh, that was uh, originally all wetland vegetated vegetation now it's all open water and so we're going to take uh, spoil from the ship berth, refill the the marsh, and revegetate it. So they have to love you. I mean, that you have to be one of the shining yeah. examples of, of doing stuff before you're even asked to do things. Yes. Well, to, you know, and... Protect and, and preserve. A lot of the problems on, on the Calcasieu Lake and in our area from saltwater intrusion is not so much... Uh, oil field canals, but it's actually the ship channel uh, that was dredged. And uh, my great 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 grandfather Krauss was actually one of the prime movers of getting the channel dug. So it's like I have an obligation to try to fix the problems that it created, you know? Yeah. So, you know, Debbie, Lafayette has uh, in, in recent surveys been said to be one of the best places to live. It's a place happiest where... Happiest place in the USA, isn't it? Happiest place in the it? USA. Oh, it's, uh, it, I, it, it I can't argue that. Has been voted. Now, one thing in, in Baton Rouge, for example, uh, that there always, there's a continual problem with is uh, LSU students, they go to school, they graduate, Southern students, they come, they graduate, they move on to bigger cities, they move away from Baton Rouge. What does, or have you noticed here in Lafayette, with UL, do you do you notice something similar, or do you notice that those going through the, the education, the universities here, that they're not necessarily taking off? That many maybe in engineering or some of the businesses that work here. Yeah, now we do have quite a bit of drain down Interstate 10 towards Houston. I'll be honest, but. I had a geologist that worked for me once, and his saying was that he could never get a wife to cross the Sabine River. So ne- wait, say that again. he could never? never get a wife across the Sabine <laughs> okay. River because girls that were raised in Acadiana, you know, they might even go off back east and get an education, but by gosh, when they graduated, <laughs> they wanted to come back to Acadiana. <laughs> you can't take for granted. Um, the ability to have a 20-minute phone conversation with the wrong number and enjoy it, right? I mean, that's something that happens <laughs> here, you know. When you go to the grocery store, you have to have a lot of time because you're going to run into people you know. You're going to have a conversation over the avocados, and you might not <laughs> know them, but you're going to talk to them anyway. So that's, you know, that's Lafayette in a nutshell. It's an ex- very friendly place, you uh, know. It's an interesting place. Interesting place. Yeah. 70 miles apart, though, there is no mistaking. There is, uh, Lafayette has its own culture, its own identity. Lake Charles, it's different. Absolutely. And we love Lake Charles. Yeah, and I love Lake Charles, too. Yeah, absolutely. But they're different, and you you know they're at different places. Yes, they're different. Well, you know, it's funny, the, the oil center that's located here, originally was in Lake Charles. That's where the, the the heart of it was. And from my understanding, it was actually 
pushed out of Lake Charles and pushed over here to Lafayette, and uh, that's what ended ended up being such a boom for Lafayette and and the diversity of of white collar workers that are here because they came from all over. So should Lake Charles really be the hub city then? <laughs> if you, you know, well, it, was, it, was, it was before my time. Yeah, right. Actually, I was in high school, but that's what they say happened that, you know, it, it some folks didn't want it and it just kind of got pushed over and slowly the oil companies that were based in Lake Charles, I remember Mobile had an office and all of those just started right. disappearing and moving over here. Interesting. Well, I know that the um, the Hymans developed the oil center in mm-hmm. Lafayette. Right, right. They had the department store downtown, and then they purchased land here, and they got some of the major oil companies to commit to drilling, um, not, sorry, not sorry, drilling, um, building a petroleum club and having all that office space. And it was just kind of like, build it and they will come sort of thing. Right, right. So. And, and uh, again, with with your companies, you look to the future and, and even the present, as you go into your office every day, what's the biggest concern on your mind as you as you go in? I can ask both of you this, actually, of course, but. Well, I mean, the price of oil and gas is certainly a concern for me because we're involved in uh, a lot of fee mineral ownership and I also participate in oil and gas, so even though the price of oil and gas has had a little more uh, significant impact here in Lafayette, it still affects us and it affects the amount of drilling that's going on on our properties and uh, and so that and just the overwhelming nature of all these people coming to Lake Charles, at first we thought, that, you know, we're developing man camps and there's RV parks everywhere. At first, we thought it was all going to hit at once, but because of delays in permitting and offtake contracts for these LNG uh, facilities, there the, and the and just the scope of them has slowed it down a little bit, which you know is good for us on the development side and good for Lake Charles that they have time to catch their breath a little bit. Uh, but you worry, uh, you know, I don't know, or you know, Lake Charles is is very dependent on trade so if there's going to be uh, trade sanctions and changes in uh, tariffs and all of that uh, you know that could have a uh, a negative effect on on some of the stuff that's going on in Lake Charles. I think in the the big picture I worry about legacy lawsuits and levy lawsuits killing the oil and gas exploration in South Louisiana. And then on a smaller scale, I, you know, Audubon takes leases for clients. And so our name is in the chain of title when we record a lease, it's in the courthouse. I'm always concerned that there's going to be a lawsuit sitting on my desk when I come in that I've been named, even though I may not have been the operator. So, um, you know, there's, when you get named in a lawsuit, whether you're guilty or not, you have to hire a lawyer to defend yourself. And it's a it's a big concern. That's why so many companies don't they don't want to spend all their money defending themselves. They want to spend their of money course, right. you know, trying to to do business, and it just it starts consuming them after a while. Right. So that's a that's that would that's what I would think. And that's a and that's a, obviously a big concern. And oh, it's certainly are. a concern for, for us. We you know we own and manage a hundred thousand acres of minerals and some of the property we've sold so we're not the surface owners anymore um, it's a huge issue we're we're still able to uh, find operators to drill on us but it, as she says it's it's dwindling down there are less and less and they're generally smaller operators um, than the shell oils of the world that used to an amico who right. used to drill here you gotta say Chad W. All of us in Acadiana and in and around Lake Charles know that we're living in changing times. So we thank you for sharing your thoughts on the current situation and future prospects for the oil field and the LNG corridor. Uh, It's been fascinating and really informative, um, this conversation with you. And uh, I've enjoyed meeting both of you. And we want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us 
on Alta Lunch. No, we really Thank appreciate you very much. it. Thank you so much Me. for having Enjoyed us. Enjoyed it. My guests on Alta Lunch today have been Debbie Springer, founder and president of Ottoman Energy, and Chad Thielen, president of the Lacassane Company, and among other interests, president of the Morgan Field and Bell Savant Development. You can find out more about Debbie's and Chad's companies by following the links on our websites, krvs.org and itsacandiana.com. Today's show is recorded live over lunch, as we mentioned, at Cafe Vermilionville, beautiful Cafe Vermilionville here in Lafayette. Cafe V is open Monday to Friday for lunch and six nights a week for dinner with a courtyard that sets the scene for fine Louisiana cuisine. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Murrell. Our researcher is Ann Christian. Our theme song is Encore Monsieur Nice Guy. It's written by Mitch Foreman and performed by Mitch Foreman and Andre Michaud. Our Acadiana business consultants are Pete Prados of Innovate Acadiana, Zach Barker of The Opportunity Machine, and also Dr. Blake Escade. If you want to know what we all look like, you can find photos from this show. It's on our website. It's also on our Facebook page. These photos are taken by Gwen O'Quan. And you can also get this show as a podcast. You can listen to past shows. And you can keep up with us on all kinds of social media by going to our websites. It's Acadiana.com and krvs.org. Support for Out to Lunch Acadiana comes from the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, located off Pinhook near Calise Saloon. Wyndham Garden Lafayette is pet and family friendly with free parking and free Wi-Fi. Additional support comes from ABIS Magazine and AcadianaBusiness.com, the essential information source for business decision makers throughout the one Acadiana region. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsacandiana.com and KRVS 88.7 FM. I'm Andre Morrow, sitting in today for Peter Rusciutti. Thanks so much for joining me, and we look forward to meeting you again next week around the lunch table here at Cafe Vermillionville for more business Acadiana style on Out to Lunch. Major support for Out to Lunch Acadiana is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker. Established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S. Providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base joneswalker.com Support also comes from Wyndham Garden Lafayette